Here. Mr. Ed Zahowski. Present. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. Councilor Shower. Here. Councilor Spector. Here. Okay. Thank you very much. So again, <coughs> um, as you know, this meeting is being called in accordance with uh, Section 7-2 of the City Charter, which as part of our annual budget process, the Mayor is to call together the School Committee and the City Council uh, to review uh, the financial condition of the City, uh, talk about revenue and expenditure and forecast for that, and other relevant information in order to develop a coordinated budget. Um, so tonight I'm going to try to cover um, uh, those issues uh, and a few other issues and then sort of review uh, the budget process timeline that we'll be working under over the next few months uh, toward our goal of getting a uh, completed FY 2015 budget in place for July 1st of 2014. Um, one of the issues that we've talked about over time uh, and in the last few years I've uh, been emphasizing this is the state of our reserve funds. Um, so I'm going to begin uh, focusing quickly on the reserve piece because that's where I started in presentations last year. So if we go to the first slide, Mary, um, this is a history of our what's called our undesignated fund balance or what's called free cash, uh, which is what the state certifies at the end of each fiscal year. Uh, this shows you a history from FY 2005 right up to uh, the current FY 2014. Um, we were very pleased uh, this year to have our free cash certified at a little bit over 3 million, 3.2 million. Um, you can see the history of this uh, particular um, uh, item, uh, including in FY10, when, uh, when the state and the nation had a very severe uh, budget situation and our aid was cut mid-year, we actually ended with a negative uh, uh, design, undesignated fund balance that year, as did many communities across the state. So we've worked very hard, uh, uh, particularly in FY13 and FY14, uh, to focus on uh, ensuring that we had a strong uh, undesignated fund balance. Uh, this is what we use primarily to both rebuild our other reserve accounts as well as using it toward uh, our capital improvement program. Uh, each year. It's been what we've used primarily to, to then infuse our capital program. Go to the next slide. Uh, this is the state of our other, uh, uh, our general fund reserves, our other reserve funds, our stabilization fund, our capital stabilization fund, and then the newly created uh, for FY14 fiscal stability stabilization fund, which as you know, when we um, asked the voters to adopt the override, part of that was to then take some of the additional revenue, not use all the revenue, but to put some of it aside. So you can see that we've been working very hard, uh, again, in the last two fiscal years, 13 and 14, to rebuild our reserve accounts. Uh, this is uh, very important. Uh, you'll see that for FY14, you can see the current balance of our reserves, and then there's a, a final line off to the right. That is actually pending a second vote of the City Council uh, Next Thursday, there was a unanimous votes on first reading, but after second reading, that will be the status of our various stabilization funds. So you can see that we've been working very hard to rebuild those and to get them back up. Next slide. Uh, this, is, uh, this is just looking at those stabilization accounts as a percentage of our general fund budget. And so you can see we're uh, following those transfers uh, next Thursday, we will be at about 3% of uh, our general fund budget. Um, our goal uh, is obviously to get up into the, you know, 5% uh, to higher range, uh, but this is, a, this is good progress. You can see again where we were in FY 2011. Uh, we were at 0.34%, uh, which is not where we want to be um, uh, in our reserve position. Next slide. Why do reserves matter? Obviously, primary reason you have reserves uh, is to be able to respond to emergency situations that occur. A uh, second important reason is our bond rating, uh, which directly correlates to the cost of borrowing for capital projects. It determines the interest rate at which we can borrow funds uh, for the capital projects that support both the city and the schools. And then in the case of uh, our capital improvement program where we use free cash, but we also have a capital stabilization fund that we use toward specifically for capital type projects. With regard to our bond rating, um, we actually had a bond rating call uh, two weeks ago. 
um, because we were, go we were going out to bond on about $2.5 million worth of, uh, of bond issues. That is in, in part some uh, bond anticipation notes that we're rolling over. We're also bonding some of our capital improvement uh, projects uh, for both the city as well as the school side. So as part of that process, we met, uh, well, we met over the phone uh, with Moody's Investor Services who've reviewed our finances about a year ago. They re-reviewed them in light of this. Um, and then they just this week issued our, um, our latest bond rating. You can turn to the next slide. Um, so Moody's bond rating service uh, uh, maintained our current strong rating, which is AA2. Uh, so they, um, after reviewing what we've been able to do, they, they kept us at our current bond rating. Um, the strengths that they noted in their report, and this report is online, it's on the city website, you can also find it at Moody's. Um, they were, as you can see, uh, uh, focused on our diverse tax base, our trend of increasing our reserve levels was noted, and the recent approval of the general override to Proposition 2.5 was looked upon as, as very favorable. Um, looking at things that could make the rating go up in the future, continued improvement. Uh, in terms of our uh, in terms of our financial operations as well as continued growth in our in our fund balances um, and then again what could make the rating go down this is coming right from Moody's uh, a decline in reserves uh, and obviously a decrease in tax base and you can see we have a quote from the uh, from Moody's going forward review of the city's credit strength will heavily weigh its progress towards continuing to improve and maintain balanced operations and re and increasing reserves to levels equivalent to similarly similarly rated communities um, again, for a community our size, uh, we're, we're doing well to hold on to this AA2 rating, but they've been telling us that we need to, again, rebuild those reserves and get them up to a level uh, so that we can maintain it. Obviously, our goal will be to increase that rating, but we were pleased that we were able to maintain the rating. Go to the next slide. So how do we compare with our neighboring communities in terms of these metrics around our reserve funds? This is certified free cash for FY 2013, which is on the left, and then the next bar, the darker bar, is for 2014. You can see Northampton sort of in the middle there where we are, uh, and then you can see neighboring communities, Agawam, West Springfield, Amherst, all the way over to uh, uh, East Longmeadow, East Hampton, and, Long, and Longmeadow. You can see changes from year to year. In our case, uh, our, we, we're able to increase our free cash between 13 and 14, um, and then you can see the variations. You can go to the next slide. Single family average value. So this is the value of the average single family home um, in our uh, in, in the state, the state average is 356,794. Here you can see the value of Northampton in blue, 298,669, and then you can com compare that with the average values in these neighboring communities. Uh, so we have very strong uh, values. Our values continue to remain high. That was one of the things that was noted in our uh, latest bond rating. Next slide. This is the average single family tax bill for FY 2014, that's the current tax bill that people are getting. The state average uh, tax bill, $5,039. Uh, you can see Northampton, uh, again, is sort of in the middle. Uh, $4,597 is our average uh, single family tax bill. And then you can see the spread uh, on either side, Longmeadow, 7,500, uh, all the way over to Agawam, uh, 3,200. Next slide. This is the residential tax rate itself. This is the per thousand rate. Again, this is, for, this is the current tax rate as uh, been certified with DOR. Um, you can see Northampton in this case is on the lower end in terms of our tax rate at $15.39 uh, per thousand. And then you can see the spread uh, all the way over to Longmeadow, which is $23.15 per thousand. So uh, just so thinking about those things, obviously we have, uh, you know, our, we're, we're strong on the value side, our, our rate is low, and that sort of puts us in the middle in terms of our, in terms of uh, the average tax bill that a single family home is being assessed in Northampton. That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, we'll have to find that one out. I'm not sure. Do they post a state average for the? Uh... No, I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to find out if they have that. Yeah. Well, and the other problem is some of those communities have a split tax rate. So That's true. That residential burden has been shifted, so it really is hard to compare. Yeah. 
especially with like West Springfield. Exactly. They're real tough. Yeah, yeah. Next slide. So this is just a quick picture of our current, the current revenue structure uh, for, for the current budget year that we're in. Um, you can actually go to the next slide because it's not as easy to see it. This is an easier way to see it. You can see that we're currently relying on taxes for 63% of our uh, current revenues. Uh, state aid is 19.5%. Uh, and then you can see the various charges for service, uh, licenses and permits, fines and forfeitures, federal aid, a whopping 0.39%. Uh, and then some miscellaneous revenue. So that's kind of the revenue structure that makes up our current budget. Uh, quick, quick yes. Just back to that slide, Mary. Um, thanks. Wh which one? The, this one here, the charges for services. Yep. So when we look just quickly, and I want more time, are those, is that the order in which those are? Um, it's just a sample. It's a, it's, okay. a, it's a sample of I them. Know it's we, not, you yeah. take a lot in from the parking. parking <coughs> yes, indeed. And actually, if you go into your budget book right. under the revenue section, you can actually see each one of them broken out and how much. So it's not enough. Yeah, it's, not it's just okay. we just wanted to give a, sam a, a sampling of what that meant, what a charge for service was. Yeah. Next slide. Um, new growth. This is one of the other important factors that we trend in terms of uh, revenue because in, in, in terms of how we grow our, our base, how we are able to um, – uh, in addition to the two and a half percent that we're allowed um, to go up each year, new growth is the other factor. So that's any of the new buildings, new businesses, new things that are coming online as of July 1st that we get to add into that uh, calculation. You can see that uh, in 2014, uh, we actually finished uh, with higher than expected uh, new growth. We were above what we had initially projected, 716,719. Um, that was a significant increase over 2013. You can see kind of the historical average of that. For 2015, in discussions with the assessors, we're currently estimating 600,000 in, uh, in potential new growth. We may refine that as we get a little bit closer to the budget process, but that's what we're looking at. Again, uh, that gets back to the whole issue of economic development and how important it is that we continue to uh, promote that as a way of creating this additional growth in our overall tax base, which supports our revenue. Next slide. Uh, this is a uncollected taxes. No need to spend a whole lot of time on this, but merely to demonstrate that if you look at uh, uh, percentage of uncollected taxes uh, as a percentage of our net levy, you'll see in FY 2013, it represents 1.15%. So uncollected taxes is not a big issue. We uh, do very well in terms of folks paying their taxes and, and collecting taxes. Next slide. Hotel, motel, and meals tax. This is another one of the revenue sources that's particularly important to us locally because we have a local option that we adopted for both hotel, motel, and meals tax. You can see actually the meals tax doesn't start till 2010 because that's when we the state gave us the ability to do that. You can see that that's been a very strong uh, revenue source for us. Uh, the red is the meals tax. Uh, the blue is the hotel, motel. Um, had very strong years in 12 and 13. Uh, 14, uh, that was actually our projection, so we don't know um, what that's going to come in at, but that was the projection that we're using. Um, and you can see, again, those have been um, important revenue sources for us, uh, obviously given the number of uh, restaurants that we have in Northampton, that's a, an important revenue source. Next slide. Net state aid. Okay, so uh, this is essentially, um, when we say net state aid, it means we're taking, um, we're taking the, the normal state aid uh, that comes into us, we're, we're uh, minusing the, the charges that we automatically have to pay, and, so, and including some of the things like the school building um, authority money, which comes right through to, as part of what we're paying off on some of our school buildings, just focusing on what the true net state aid is after uh, those um, things are, are taken into account. So you can obviously see the trend. Uh, you can see in FY 2008, we, we got back to the top of the recession roller coaster, and then we went down sharply. Uh, you can see that uh, we dipped way down into FY 2012. Um, we've come up. Uh, but uh, even the FY 2015 projection that the governor just put out actually represents a slight decrease from last year. This is the governor's projected budget that he just put out. Um, actually, in terms of net state aid, uh, we're actually getting less in net state aid than we did last year. We can go to the next slide. 
So this is just the chart that we've shown and I've talked about and talked about it in the paper the other day when we were asked what, asked what I thought about the level funding. Um, if we go back to just that top of the roller coaster 2009, if we had just been level funded in state aid um, for, for those years coming forward, that's about $15 million uh, that that would represent. So you know, we've had to essentially backfill uh, those uh, losses in state aid um, as we go forward. Um, and that percentage, of the state aid as a percent of our budget has continued to get smaller and smaller each year. Um, so that's why this whole issue of uh, state aid is, um, is going to be very important in this budget year because the state is proposing, the governor is proposing to increase overall spending by 4.9 percent, um, yet his budget level funds uh, unrestricted local aid. Um, and make some some increases in Chapter 70, but but uh, but clearly not commensurate with uh, the rest of the spending in the budget. Next slide. This is Chapter 70. Uh, this is uh, Chapter 70 aid to cities and school uh, to, to to both the city schools as well as Smith Voke. Uh, the the blue line is Smith Voke. The red line is um, is the Northampton Public Schools. You can basically see that it's uh, remained fairly flat over time. The FY 2015 projection, um, this is again in the governor's budget, um, we would fall into the sort of the minimum aid category that they are projecting, uh, which is a, an additional, I think, $25 per student, which would basically, under the, the current cherry sheet, would uh, net us an increase of about $70,000 um, uh, from what we received in Chapter 78 last year. Um, interestingly, if you look at our minimum contribution line, I mean, we, we, um, we are well above net school spending, but if you look at what the minimum contribution line is for Northampton Public Schools this year, they're actually raising it by about 900,000, our minimum contribution, um, and giving us 70,000 more dollars um, in order to meet that. So, um, so the Chapter 70 is gonna be another one of the areas that um, uh, we'll be having to ha look to the House and Senate um, if we're gonna see uh, changes in what those numbers are gonna reflect. Uh, next slide. This is the unrestricted local aid. This is, again, everything else um, uh, other than that Chapter 70 money. It used to be lottery and additional assistance. Then they blended it all together and called it UGA, or unrestricted government aid. Uh, you can see, again, very flat uh, from 13, 14. Um, and it's definitely flat in 15, because uh, they're the, the 15 is the governor's proposed budget. So we're plugging that in right now, at least, as a preliminary revenue number. Um, the uh, the uh, sec uh, Secretary of Administration and Finance, I was at the MMA conference this weekend, and he was taking a lot of incoming about this from municipal officials, and he said, we're not, we're not, we're not level funding it, we're maintaining the increase from last year. That was the, uh, that was the rationale that he gave. Um, so good luck with that one. Next slide. These are some other, um, looking at some other revenue sources, uh, parking revenues from our parking meters and ambulance revenues. These are revenues um, that we are relying on to balance the budget, to, to fund general operating expenses. You can see essentially that, um, well, the slide sort of tells two things. You can see that we had an uptick in our parking uh, meter receipts from 12 to 13. Uh, you may recall that we did a change in our rates that year. We, we raised many of our parking meter rates that year, so that reflects that uptick. You can also see that our ambulance revenues have started to level off and, in fact, have, have slightly decreased um, from it, their high water mark in FY 2012. We're now sort of seeing that system stabilize and level out, no longer providing service to West Hampton, which we had been. Um, so those are a couple of revenue sources that we look at. You can also see from 2009 to 2010 when we went to full-time ambulance, the, you know, how we really took off in terms of ambulance revenue. So those are one of those um, revenues that we're always tracking very carefully because they contribute to our, our general fund budget. Next slide. These are the inner fund operating transfers. So these are uh, the um, funds that are paid to the general fund by our three enterprise funds, uh, sewer in brown, uh, blue for water, and uh, yellow for solid waste. Um, interesting, uh, you know, this slide sort of shows you a few things. Obviously, uh, the solid waste enterprise fund, uh, you can see, has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller as we've closed the landfill. 
uh, you can see that in FY14, it's contributing $97,000 to the general fund. Um, and this year, we uh, project it may even go down slightly more. Um, and you can see um, other variations in that. But again, this is uh, you know one of the things that contributes to the general fund. And again, this is enterprise funds are specifically to be used for those enterprises, um, but we, they are allowed to pay for indirect services that the city provides to support them, um, such as the billing, the legal, the financial uh, that the city provides. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, parking tickets and RMV fines. Uh, again, uh, just showing you some of the trends there. Not a lot of variation uh, in terms of uh, in terms of that. Uh, but again, it's it's one of those re revenue sources. Next slide. Uh, this is our building uh, inspections, uh, uh, building, plumbing, wiring, weights and measures, and permit fees. Again, this is very sensitive to the economy as people are building more, as growth is occurring. You can see uh, 2013, which was a big year for growth. Uh, not surprisingly, the, the, uh, the permits that were pulled track that. They, that we saw an increase. Um, 2014, uh, that's what we have projected uh, for 2014. Uh, we're, we're thinking it's going to come in pretty close to that, uh, and we're going to be working with the building commissioner to figure out what our estimates are going to be to use for that revenue for 2015. Next. Investment income. Uh, Again, this is uh, one, another one of those revenue sources that have gone down over time because of the uh, low interest rate environment. Uh, you can see where we are in 2014 in terms of interest income to the city, uh, $80,000 uh, we're earning in interest. Um, it's significant because you look where we were in 2007, uh, we were earning $623,000 a year in interest. So that's half a million dollars in lost revenue just because of the uh, interest environment. Next slide. So now just looking at our expenditures, uh, go to the next slide because this is just, it's, it's just easier to see it this way. Uh, you can see we've got a breakdown, 37.8% education, uh, employee benefits, uh, uh, almost 20%. That's retirement, uh, workers' comp, payroll taxes, uh, insurance. Uh, public safety, 14.4%. Debt service, 7%. Uh, general government, 4.9%. Public works, 39 And then you can see the smaller uh, categories. That's sort of the, the current mix of how those funds are allocated. Next slide. Now, I always <coughs> make this little disclaimer, especially when I'm with my colleagues on the school committee, um, that, that percentage that I showed you doesn't give you the true picture of all of the educational expenditures that we make as part of the budget. Because of course, employee benefits for the schools, which we pay out of the city side, but it goes to school employees, uh, $8 million, insurance, school crossing guards, which come out of the police budget, but they obviously support the school. Uh, debt for school capital projects are paid for out of the general fund. Um, and then there's other things, charter school tuition for outgoing students and school choice tuition for outgoing students comes off the city's uh, uh, you know, cherry sheet right out, right out of our aid. It doesn't come out of the school budget. So if you put all those things together uh, and add that total additional spending, it's actually more like $46,586, uh, which represents, if you go to the next slide, 55% um, of our budget is spent on education related, again, for both NPS and for Smith Folk. Next slide. Uh, so this is the general fund appropriation for education. This is what the city uh, appropriates to uh, Smith Vocational in the dark blue at the bottom, and then NPS is in the lighter blue at the top. Um, again, you can, see the, uh, you can see what the trend has been like over time. Uh, significantly, I would point out for FY uh, 2014 budget, the budget that we're in, you can see um, that we made some significant increases because related to the override. Uh, so the increase uh, to Smith Vokes budget is 6.43% and NPS 6.27% because again, we were infusing um, significant funds into the NPS budget. SV, uh, Smith Voke uh, increased its tuition, which increased its uh, revenue and, and the overall appropriation. Um, so you can see how that trend has gone in terms of uh, the general fund appropriation for education. Next slide. This is school choice and charter school sending tuition. Um, and this is net of the state charter tuition reimbursement. We often have been, when I 
show slides like this, I've been said, well, you have to take into effect that you do get reimbursed for some of it. So <coughs> what we've done is we've, we've put this net of the reimbursement. So this is just showing after we've been, even after we've been reimbursed, this is how much is going out uh, for school choice and for charter school. Um, and you can see uh, that it's been on a significant upward trend. Uh, and you can see that uh, in 2014, we're, we're uh, you know, $2.3 million uh, those items represent. And so that's a significant issue for us, particularly given the number of charter schools that we have around us. Um, and uh, for FY 2015, uh, the governor's, uh, the projections, again, show another increase uh, over what we're looking at for 2014. So that's one of our uh, budget drivers, and it's something I know uh, we talk about on the school committee, and it's an issue that we um, even talk about on the state level, but that is one of our significant budget drivers that, uh, that we have to uh, be mindful of in the years ahead. Next slide. Health insurance, uh, employee health insurance. Um, this has been, again, one of, the, one of the bigger cost drivers. It's a major part of that general fund budget. Uh, you know, $10 million of the current uh, FY 2014 uh, general fund budget. You can see the trends over time. Uh, uh, down below, uh, up above gives you the real numbers, down below gives you the percentage uh, uh, changes over time. You can see kind of the spikes. We did a lot of great work uh, 2009 uh, through 2012 to try to keep those costs down. Uh, really, you know, our employees worked with us to try to, to keep those costs down, to make plan changes, um, but obviously that's been one that's been going up. You can see the averages, the 10-year average increase of 4.8%. Over the last five years, we've been able to keep that at 2.7%. We were able uh, to see a decrease overall from 13 to 14. Part of that is the move to the GIC, to the Group Insurance Commission. Um, we don't see the full savings of that uh, because for half the year of 14, we, stayed with, we had to stay with our uh, traditional uh, insurance. We didn't actually move in until January 1st, so it kind of splits two fiscal years. But health insurance is obviously one of the big drivers, and we'll continue to be watching that as we try to put together this budget. Retirement assessment. Uh, this is the uh, mandatory assessment that we pay uh, into the uh, Northampton uh, Contributory Retirement System. Um, you can see that we've, uh, you can see the increases that we've had over time. Uh, and again, that's one of those um, items that there's a lot of discussion about at the state level, about, uh, about pensions and about other than post-employment employment benefits. Um, uh, this is, again, one of the drivers that, uh, that we look at very carefully. Next. Oh, yes. Um, why would we have a, uh, can we go back to the previous slide for a second? Mm -hmm. Why would we have a, such a spike in, in 12,000, I mean, in 2005? Uh, what would what would drive such a spike in then for going back? Well, every back? every couple of years, there's a um, they go through a process where they uh, reassess where um, you know what we have to do to, to pay into it. The other thing that's at work is the is the stock well, the stock market, if you will, the the size of the investments, how those are performing, and so often they have to make a, a correction. Um, in terms of the assessment. You can actually see in 2014, uh, we had to make a 5.8% increase, and that was largely due to the fact that when they did that reassessment, uh, they looked at where we were in terms of the glide path to getting to a fully solvent system, and they had to, we basically had to make an increased contribution in order to get back on track to do that. So that explains some of those fluctuations. And um, you know how earlier, um you know, compared to other surrounding communities, is, are our health costs in line um, percentage-wise with other surrounding communities, roughly? I mean, do we fall, where do we fall? Yeah, I don't know that we've done a comparison of that. It's interesting. We can, we can try to see if we can find that type of a comparison. Cities and towns, since the passage of, um, of the um, Health Insurance Reform Act, now have to report every year to, uh, to state government what their, uh, what their costs are. Um, part of that was, I think, a way for state government to track both savings under the law, but also probably to show communities why haven't you done this, why haven't you moved into this uh, system. So um, we don't have that one, but that, that's a good point. We can look at that and see how we're doing. Obviously, other communities have different um, size workforces. They ha may not be in the GIC. They may have a different provider. Um, we do have some of our surrounding communities um, that are in the Hampshire County health system. 
Um, I think East Hampton is in the Hampshire County Health System. Um, so mm, see if we could figure out a way to compare apples to apples. Thank you. Yep. Next, next slide. Um, this is our debt, our general fund debt expenditures. This is what we have to pay towards our debt every year. You can see um, how, that has, uh, how that has changed um, over time. Um, 2013, uh, I believe we're showing there that the uh, police station came online that first year onto the debt schedule. Um, we're projecting that to go down slightly for FY 2014, and that's a combination of both long-term bonds uh, and, uh, and shorter-term bonds, and the, you can barely see some red ones. Those are some capital leases, but we don't actually have, I don't think, any current capital leases. That was for things like leasing an ambulance uh, to, to lease to buy. Next. This is uh, just taking a look at uh, um, expenditures in, in certain um, budget areas. Uh, so this is public safety, police, fire, and EMS, and, dis and dispatch. Um, you can see the trends for public safety. Uh, obviously, FY 2014, uh, uh, you look at it and you think, wow, we must have hired you know, 20 new officers, or we must have really um, made some significant increases. Part of what you're seeing there is we settled uh, contracts um, retroactively in 2014 that went back uh, several fiscal years. You may remember for the fire department, for example, it was a three-year retroactive contract plus uh, the red. So some of what you're seeing in 2014, um, if you really, some of that should each be applied to 13, 12, and 11. It's just we spent it in 14, but we had to do it retroactively uh, to cover those previous contracts. But that's sort of what our spending trends have been for, for public safety. Next. This is general government uh, and public works. Public works is in blue. General government uh, is in the brown. Again, uh, just showing the, uh, showing the trends in that particular area. Yes. So are, they, are these in real dollars, or these don't take into account inflation? These are real dollars. Real dollars. Yeah, these are just, this is literally, if you look at our so, FY 2005 budget, that's how much we spent so for we the just, general government right, category. So if we just put this on there, inflation itself would demand over a 10-year period that these numbers would go up, correct? Uh, probably so, but obviously we've the gone, we, we've, the cost are we've go tried up to cut, same. we've tried to do level funded okay. budgets every year in, in some cases to try to uh, absorb those increases. Um, and so there's been a lot of cutbacks, particularly in public works, yeah. uh, where um, we've had to uh, cut back on the number of staff that we, think, well, that we have. Next slide. Uh, this is actually snow and ice and legal, uh, which I thought um, we've talked a lot about. Um, we've talked a lot about these accounts, snow and ice account, which is you know the, the funds that we use to, to fight snowstorms when they happen. Legal budget is our city's uh, legal expenses from year to year. Um, and these are two of the ones that uh, tend to be very unpredictable. Uh, obviously, the, the snow and ice one is is about as predictable as the weather. Uh, and so depending on the types of winters that we have, we spend more, we spend less. Legal the same way. Um, you can see in FY 2013, we had a, a spike in our legal expenses. Um, we were essentially in negotiations with all of our uh, unions at that point, so we spent a lot more in terms of collective bargaining that year, as well as the charter change happened. Um, and we were doing a lot of work related to the charter change. The city solicitor was involved in that. We also had the JLMC arbitration case, uh, which was very uh, uh, lawyer intensive. Uh, and so, uh, so that just shows you that those are, we've tried very hard to use historic data to budget, at, to, to put more money toward those, to get out of the cycle of under budgeting and then having to use free cash to backfill. Um, which is, again, one of the things that they looked at in our bond rating, that the fact that we've been more forward funding those um, and using free cash for what it should be used for, which is not to support operations. Um, so anyway, that that's just gives you a sense of how those fluctuate from year to year. Go ahead. Uh, this is human service uh, spending, um, veteran services, Council on Aging, Board of Health. Um, obviously, the veterans one looks like it's off the chart, but again, those are, um, uh, it is, has been off the chart, but uh, we do get reimbursed 75% for those funds in the next year. But that, the veterans budget clearly shows the increase in the number of veterans that we're serving as the number of veterans have increased with the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Go to the next slide. This actually shows you that trend um, 
over that 10 year period. Uh, and the blue is actually the 75% that we get reimbursed the next year by the state. The green is actually the city's portion over time. Um, while we do get reimbursed, we still have to budget for it in the fiscal year. We have to put up the money. So we, that's still, um, in 2013, we still had to budget for, uh, you know, close to 700000 for that line item, uh, even though we would get reimbursed the next year. Next slide. Uh, this is culture and recreation spending. So these are our libraries, Forbes and Lilly, uh, Rec Department, um, Arts Council, and then you can see First Night, uh, which is one of our categories. Um, and, uh, and so this just sort of shows you the trends in terms of uh, culture and recreation spending. Um, in the libraries, we have a minimum contribution that the state requires us to make, um, which we have uh, adhered to. Um, and in the other areas, again, you can see we've, we've Try to make investments in those important programs, but uh, you can see that it's been an area that's been fairly, fairly flat over time. Next slide. So, uh, so that's sort of the the picture in terms of where we are with the, um, uh, the current revenues, current expenditures, some of the projections. We still have a lot of information that we're waiting on. Um, health insurance is one of the big numbers uh, that we will be hearing about. Uh, the state, the GIC itself, um, goes through a whole process every year uh, where it sets the rates that, uh, that the, the participating uh, plans in the GIC program uh, will charge. So we'll know those numbers. They're going to have a hearing on uh, those various plans and rates in February, and then they set the rate uh, early in March. So we're going to get our number uh, for health insurance, which is a big number. I mean, that's $10 million of our budget. So, you know, a 1% increase is a million dollars. <coughs> so that's a, that's a significant increase, could be a significant increase. Um, so we'll be watching that number. Obviously, the state aid number that I talked about, the governor has put out his budget. Um, I can say at the MMA conference, uh, the Speaker of the House also uh, made an appearance. Um, and, uh, and he was very clear that uh, they were committed uh, in the House to increasing local aid, uh, that they, they, were, they were not satisfied with a level funded um, local aid number. So we're hoping that between now and uh, when we put our budget together, and I know that uh, MMA is going to be lobbying very hard for the House and the Senate to give some kind of a number to cities and towns, at least the House budget the House Ways and Means budget usually tends to be a really good predictor of the final number. So we're hoping we're going to get that aid number so we can plug that in. Um, and again, this is sort of the process that we'll be using. Much of it is dictated by the charter. So January 30th is tonight. Uh, that's not, the date's not really dictated, but we start the process with this joint meeting. Um, I've asked city departments to submit budgets uh, to me by February 6th. And I should say that um, what I've asked city departments to do is actually create for me level service budgets. Um, in past years, we've gone through the level funded budget, which means, um, you know, take what you got last year and try to do everything you were doing last year with the same amount of money. Um, which has effectively meant cuts. So what I've instructed our department heads to do is, as a baseline, is to this year work with a level service budget. So take you know, what you're doing right now, incorporate primarily the increases in labor costs through the contracts, um, and give us those budgets as a starting line. We're going to be meeting with um, each department individually uh, to go through their individual budgets. Obviously, some departments may have some additional adjustments that they may, may, need, may need to make, and we'll have to do those on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I will be setting up meetings with the schools, the school departments, uh, uh, with the um, uh, superintendent um, and, uh, and her budget director. Same thing with Smith Voke and their uh, budget director, uh, business manager. Um, to go over uh, their budgets and what we're looking at in terms of, uh, of a projected number, as well as the libraries, um, which are two other of our, of our um, uh, non-city systems that we have to budget with. So we'll be going through that process while we're simultaneously waiting for some more of these revenue pictures to clear up. Meantime, March 3rd, 2014, under the new charter, I'm required to submit a five-year capital improvement program to City Council. Um, that's not a funding document for them to vote on. It's basically a, a blueprint for the next five years of 
these are the capital projects that we see over the next five years, um, and this is how we're gonna fund them. Um, it's a little bit of a departure from what we've done in the past, which has basically been, um, we're gonna put up there every single project we know of in the city. Um, we really, the, the charter now requires that we not only um, put it out there, what we wanna do in the next five years, but how we're gonna pay for it. So this is gonna be a refined list of what we think we can pay for and what we plan to fund over the next five years. Obviously, we have to do this every year, so that list is gonna be changing. We'll be re-updating it every year. Um, uh, so that's gonna be another item that'll come forward. Again, this is just the plan, not the actual funding of the plan. Um, uh, so April 15th uh, is the date by charter that both the schools, the public, Northampton Public Schools and Smith Voc um, have to adopt their budgets and submit them to the mayor. Um, so that then I can begin working to incorporate them so that I can meet my, my deadline of May 15th in which I'm required to present a proposed FY 2015 budget to the city council. Um, then there are two important deadlines that happen for the city council. Uh, the city council um, by June 1st um, has to have had a public hearing and voted on that five-year capital improvement plan. That's again by charter. And then by June 30th, uh, I think we meant 2014 there, but it says 3014, a uh, little typo. Uh, that's the deadline uh, for the city council to have held a public hearing on the budget and obviously to have voted on the budget uh, so that we can get it into place for July 1st. Um, so that's sort of the process uh, as it's laid out and, um, and we'll obviously be trying, I'll be trying to keep both the council and the school committee apprised of new developments and obviously meeting uh, with the superintendent um, uh, to keep uh, her apprised as we go forward. So that's the presentation for tonight and I would just uh, open the floor to any questions or comments that people have. In reference to the um, level service budget that you've asked for for each department, um, I guess, uh, um, is it safe to assume that the uh, across the board increase would, that would be the whatever negotiated contractual raises there are for each department, that pretty much the baseline where, where the increase would be for a level service? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty, much, that's pretty right. much it. Now, there may be individual departments. As I said, when we meet with them, there may be specific needs in individual apartments. There may be, um, for example, a good example, um, you know, we'll be planning in this budget for Florence Fields coming online, uh, which is under construction and we will be con finishing construction this year. Part of what we need to incorporate into DPW's operating budget is, um, you know, we're basically creating this new facility. We're, we're not doubling, but close to the number of recreation fields we have. It's a major facility, so we're going to have to figure out adding uh, the additional resources to maintain that going forward. So there may be cases like that. So my question then about generally, I, I was just asking, is there any way to give a general sense about what that across the board negotiated increase, I'm, I'm assuming it's in the 1% range. Uh, for Just across the board. I know we have many, many different contracts. For 14, wow. Um, uh, I, I mean, it, we know it's not 5%. We oh, no, know it's exactly. not 3%. Yeah. I'm it's, just assuming it's, it's somewhere in the 1% range. I think that's probably uh, accurate. One to There's steps, too. And there's steps, and steps. as well. Yeah. Um, I can get you that information. I mean, I we have a generally we, just yeah. as a ballpark. So we know we're not talking 5%. We no, no, no. We're no, not no, talking no. even 2%. No. Probably or somewhere in the 1 to 2% range. Yeah, I, I don't have the chart, but I have a chart which is, shows all the collective bargaining agreements, right. and I can get that yeah, to you. That's helpful. Yeah, so that you can see it across the board. Yeah. Uh, uh, Councillor Adams and then Councillor Dunn. Uh, you stated that the state's mandated we raise our contribution $900,000 to the schools. And, and they're only giving us um, seventy thousand. Yeah, yeah, and and I should and again as I as I preface that with, uh, we're already making um, you know Northampton is already above net school spending in terms of its contribution, so that's not going to affect us. There are many other communities across the state that um, that are butting up against their net school spending number, where that would have a real major impact. Um, I was with. Who was it that was really upset? Uh, Rentham, I think it was Rentham, was very upset. They were in a situation where they were right up at the um, at net school spending. Their minimum contribution was going up significantly, 
uh, and they were having to uh, essentially come up with the funding to meet that, and they were really getting only a minimal amount of new Chapter 70 aid. Uh, so uh, that's more, for us, it's, it, that is not as impactful because we're already above net school spending. Um, but for a community that's on the, on the close and just, just meeting net school spending, uh, that type of an increase could be uh, significant because it basically means you have to find, you know, $900,000 out of your general fund budget um, uh, to be able to, uh, to meet that requirement. So if you look at our, our they basically every community gets a sheet um, that gives that breakdown. It talks about what their foundation budget is, what their minimum requirement is, what their aid structure is, um, and it gives all those numbers. It's on the DOR website. We can send a link out about that. Um, but that's what I was referring to. Oh, I'm sorry, no, Councilor no. O'Donnell. Um, so FY15 will be the first full year of the new health insurance um, program. You've that's that's correct. Enrolled, isn't it? Um, I don't remember if your slide showed this or not, but would you expect there to be a, a total decrease for our expenditures in health care, or is there still kind of a naturally occurring increase that would put us over what it has been for uh, FY14? We, 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 um, we think that there will, be, well, part of what we see too is we were, when we projected the savings, uh, which is what the GI, what, what the health reform law uses to calculate the savings um, from going into that system. They look at what you were paying under your old plan um, versus what the, what the um, year for the next plan would be. Um, we, we do then have the actual moving into the plan and people then actually making decisions about, you know, I'm gonna go into Health New England or I'm gonna go to Fallon or I'm gonna go to whatever. Um, and then, of course, we have new employees come on, we have new people, so those numbers may not track exactly. We are going to see, um, we will see probably a slight increase, uh, but we won't really know for sure until we get that rate on March 3rd. Um, but the goal, I mean, we had projected, for example, um, you know, we were projecting about a 3% increase in some of our long-term planning, just as a natural mm -hmm. increase that would occur in health care. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think we thought we'd be at level funding, um, but uh, but that's what we were projecting, and now we'll have to wait to see what the rate increases are. But certainly, any increase is much less than it would have been had that's we not the, made this exact change. Exactly. And again, we were looking uh, last year at an initial quote that was going to be seven eight percent increase. Um, so it was a significant savings to move into the GIC program. Um, Thank you. Did you want to add anything to that, Susan? But we also have to budget for the mitigation fund. And that's the other piece of it is that part of the savings under the health um, under the health reform act, um, we have to say, share a, a percentage of the savings with employees. So part of the bargaining that with the um, with the unions that I did to move into that was we also had to take a percentage of the savings, put it into a mitigation fund, and we share that savings with the employees, um, both employees and retirees. Uh, so that's also cuts into some of the savings uh -huh. that we have to account for. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Councilor Dwight. The, uh, on your graph that showed the growth based on, uh, on, on, for 2014, is that based on permits that have been taken out or would you project maybe taken out on the? It's, it's, um, it's actually, it's sort of like on July 1st, it's, uh, it's any new growth that's, that's occurring in the city. And so, you know, um, uh, Joan and Joe uh, calculate that new properties that have changed hands. They do look at permits that have been pulled for things that are under construction. And then they do a, a, a calculation about how much that actually will add um, to, to the base. And so, you know, they had projected a number. It actually came in much higher um, after the state uh, did that and actually the difference closed out to our free cash balance. It was about two hundred thousand dollars difference So that closed out to free cash. Because so because as it compared to 2013 there was a there was a drop but I, And so yeah, there was answer my yeah. question that, that that it's entirely possible that the in the end that number may even reflect <coughs> Higher revenue generation for the growth possibly. Yeah. Yeah, so again, that's a number that <coughs> You know, you may have a project that starts in one year, that finishes in one year. You know, you've got the Round Hill Road, uh, the Clark School, which 
um, is factored <coughs> in. Uh, just the sale of the land, the base sale of the land got added to our new growth. But as the apartments get built out and start generating income, that will increase uh, their contribution to the tax base as well. So this July 1st, there'll probably be another uh, you know, impact in that regard. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it, but, but again, the idea, the goal is to see that new growth number go up because other than that 2.5% each year, the only other thing we get to add to the 2.5% is new growth. Well, was the reason I asked. Because yeah. Because it, it would be more encouraging to realize that that could still improve mm -hmm. and that would indicate a, a more hopeful trend as opposed to one that indicated that it was on <coughs> it was declining from the previous year. Yeah. Yeah. Councilor. Fine. <laughs> the, the meals tax revenue mm -hmm. went down for the first time in, in, in any of the previous years. Uh, is that right? Uh, no. Our estimate for 2014. I think what you were seeing was our estimate for 2014 um, was probably uh, a, a little, little more lower. conservative. So you probably were seeing the 2014. That wasn't the real. That was the estimated. Um, so that may have been what you saw. Um, yeah, I think 2014 is asterisked. Um, so that's our that's what we used as an estimate, and we had to set that, you know, back in you know March, April of of uh, this year. Um, and so we set that as our estimate. Obviously, 13 I think came in slightly above estimate, uh, a little bit above estimate. That was part of our free cash. So, um, so you know, we hope 14 comes in where we budgeted it, obviously, but but we suspect it's going to follow the trend of continuing to be a little bit higher. Um, yes, Councilor Murphy. But that's based on what about three quarters of a percent? Yeah, 0.75. So, the state makes like five million dollars out of Northampton on this thing. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. I mean, they split hotel and motel with us pretty evenly, but yes, not so with meals. Yeah, and that's exactly that's a very good point, and I know you've made it before, and it's a good one to think. That loser on state yes. aid, but they're still taking five million dollars out of here every year on meals tax. Exactly. So that, that's locally generated revenue. We get to keep 0.75 percent of it, uh, an additional 0.75 that we voted to add on. Um, so that's a perfect example of. It would be great to have more they local that, revenue sources they split that split that even with us. Yeah, that's exactly. A big override for us. Uh, yes, it would be. <laughs> yes, it would be. But it would be a big. Every they, year. they'd need to do something. <laughs> uh, they'd have to have a tag sale, um, which would be a bad thing. Uh, okay. okay. Other questions? Oh. I just wanted to add the first two quarters for this fiscal year for hotel and motel and meals have been almost identical to last year. So I would say we're going to end up in 14 earning just about what we did in 12 and 13, which were identical. So yeah. it looks like. I mean, the other thing to note, again, getting back to the new growth, if you've driven down Con Street lately, you'll see there's three stories of a 108-room hotel coming online. So that's going to be 108 additional hotel rooms that's going to continue, that's going to generate more local revenue, hopefully. So, um, so that's a twofer. We're getting new growth to the tax base, but also another uh, potential source of that hotel motel tax. Other questions or comments about the process or, or just any other general questions? into the projection, something like that, where there's potential for more children from Northampton to go? Is there a way to calculate that? That's a good question. I mean, they're going to be, they're going to be moving, and I think they're opening, are they planning to open this next coming school year? Yes. Um, and so, uh, so that's going to be one of those things we're going to have to look at. Um, I think we're going to have to try to, uh, will DOR be giving us an estimate based on those new seats or they, they when they give us the cherry sheet they give us an estimate of charter and outgoing school choice mm -hmm. and each time the house does the budget then the senate does the budget that number changes based on what they have for enrollment yeah. so we always go with those numbers we don't make another leap that says 
we think more people are going to go. We just suck it up or, or, or whatever. So we just. But that's a valid concern. If is, there's, if there's going to be additional seats opening at the school, which is going to be even closer to us, a school that already the majority, the vast majority of its students come from Northampton, that is a concern. I know that was a concern of that. Uh, I believe Superintendent Nash expressed in writing uh, to the Department of Education when uh, they asked for our opinion about the siting of the school. Uh, so close to, to Northampton. And as usual, they listen. Yeah, they listen, yes. <laughs> um, I think you were polite. I don't think uh, Mayor Towsnick was very polite about it. He was very blunt about his not wanting that school to be located um, in East Hampton, um, as well as in his industrial park in a parcel that was a taxable parcel that's now going to be a non-taxable parcel. So um, mm -hmm. so that's going to be a growing concern. And, and um, I realized this can be, um, you know, can be a third rail issue of sorts because we have a lot of families in Northampton that choose to go to uh, charter schools, and so we obviously have to be respectful of those families and their choices. But the funding structure uh, remains problematic, in my view, and it's something that I think we need to have a conversation about at the, particularly at the state level, just about the structure of it, um, because again, uh, that. Uh, well, that's not the slide, but you know, two point whatever million it is um, that's coming, you know, off of our budget um, has a significant impact. Uh, it has a significant impact citywide, and also what we're able to fund into our own schools. Yes. Well, just just building on that on that question and, and this topic, you were at the MMA uh, conference this weekend, and you must have heard uh, cities and towns clamoring for more local aid. Do you? feel that there's the same sense of urgency in terms of changing possibly um, the payment formula for, for school, um, for charter schools. For, for, yeah, for charter schools. It's, that, it's, is there that it's, sense It's different statewide? because really, because not all 351 cities and towns are affected that equally, because right. you have to have charter schools near you. You know, you have to have, you know, like for example us, we have, you know, we have them all around us. Right. Um, whereas other mayors that I talk to, they, they may not have any charter schools. I mean, the mayor of Boston, uh, you know, talk to the mayor of Boston, uh -huh. he's probably got some issues around charter school funding, but there are many communities that this is not even an issue. Um, and, and I know that's, you know, that's one of the things that the Mass Association of School Committees has put forward as a policy idea is that because these are state chartered schools, um, the idea that they've put forward is they should be funded with their own Chapter 70 allotment each school should have its own Chapter 70 allotment, which means that the funding stream would be shared on a statewide, uh -huh. would come out of the statewide budget. Uh -huh. um, so it would be spread across all 351 cities and towns. Um, um, obviously that would then um, put those schools on the same footing somewhat with schools like ours, which means that we, they would be at the whim of the funding cycle of the budget and, and Chapter 70 levels and all those kinds of things. So. There's um, <clears throat> not a big appetite within the charter school community to do that, no, no. Um, as you can imagine. Uh, okay. But that's that's sort of one of the alternatives that's been talked about. Um, and there's bills filed every year to do it. Um, and I don't know um, what the prospects are. Um, yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't see a slide that broke down our charter costs and our school choice sending and receiving tuitions. Where where does that lie? Well, we I know for a while we actually did okay on that. We do okay. We definitely do okay on the choice. choice. We definitely, it's a revenue maker Make for us. For us. We, yeah. we make out in the transaction there. We, we, we take in more students than we send yeah. out. But I mean, on the city side, we don't, we don't always see the final map for that. We have charter out, we have sending out, and we have choice in. And mm -hmm. We used to do okay when those three things were considered together. Yeah. Where are we now? Because that's something about, we don't always see in the city. About, we're, we're losing by about a million. What's about it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, because so the that, choice that, coming in is about 1.4. One, one, between 1.1 1 .1 and 1 1.4 is, is the choice in, and we have about 400,000 going out on uh, choice out. And netting those against With charter, charter yeah. gets you to your number. Yeah, because we used to be, it used to be a lot more favorable. It's going, going the other way now. Well, that's. I think we we didn't have um, as many charters. As many charters. So with the growth of charters and more kids going to charters. Well, the reimbursements has been uh, 
reduced, right? That you have the, the formula for that has, has not been fully funded. Um, the, the full vision of the law has not been fully funded. Well, and it's, it's declining. So you get some reimbursement for the first couple of years that the student goes, and then you're basically not getting anything. So yeah. it's, it helps you up front when they initially leave to go to a charter, but then it tapers off. Any other uh, questions? Yes, yes Mayor. Um, I've received several calls within the past three days. Um, the situation of the consultant being hired for the busing, has anybody heard anything about the report on the Yes. Um, uh, we expect a report in 30 to 60 days. Yeah, and I think, and I just want to be clear um, that uh, it's, I have all the, um, the newspaper uh, framed it as a consultant that was being brought in to study the bus system. It's actually we're we're paying uh, the vendor for our proprietary software that we use to do our bus system to essentially try to reprogram their software uh, to reprogram their software to see if they can uh, make a new um, hub system work. Um, so I just wanted to clarify what that was. That's what that expenditure was for. Um, so, but that's what's happening, and we don't have that uh, back yet. So, Mr. Ball. Well, um, I would just like to urge Councilor Labarge to, um, you know, pass that information or to the constituents and tell them to, you know, talk to the at-large or talk to um, their school committee representative, like Ms. Minnick. So, um, because she hasn't been receiving phone calls and. Um, and I just think just to direct it would be a suggestion. Councillor Dwight. Um, I, just, I just want to say, as we've seen you some of that, that um, the, despite everything that you described, we've been in much, we've had much dire meeting, more dire meetings than we've experienced tonight. Mm -hmm. And um, so I want to give you your due and Susan Wright's due for creating the stability. You have, you have long-term contracts which give you the flexibility to project out and to move within the system. There is no override or impending. There, we're not backed up against the same wall that we were before the citizens decided that it was important to reinvest in the community. That's translated into the stability that you described tonight and also the, the maintaining the bond rating and our ability to continue to provide services even at, at a, at, at a moderate level we're not we're not long meadow but then of course long meadow has a 23 percent tax rate so in and by the way um, a cursory glance puts us smack dab in the middle of the state for tax rates as i've looked up on that um long meadow is the highest but that on some level makes sense i suppose so I'm just, I'm thanking you for the fact that I get to sleep a little better after this meeting as opposed to the one similar that we experienced last year. This mm -hmm. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Sleep tight. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I want to comment on the role that new growth has played, particularly on the commercial side. Yeah. Um, you talked about the, the new hotel, which is the gift that keeps on giving because you get property taxes, meals taxes, you get rooms taxes. I mean, that's about the best thing you can do. And but, we're trying uh, to get them a liquor license so they can, they can <laughs> get some even more taxes, some additional taxes. That yes. seems, you get thirsty, you get hungry, and it's good for us. But on the other side, um, there are still things in the chain. I mean, you were talking about what our new growth has been mm -hmm. in the last two years, and that's substantial because unlike state aid that comes and goes, you know, that's the gift that keeps on giving. That's ours. It pays every year. It's and, built into the base. And it continues to, yeah. to subsidize us. And, the, and the, uh, the new growth number that was up there is the taxes on the growth. That's not the dollar value of the growth. That's the tax dollars generated by the growth. So the growth has been substantial. And there's you know a couple of car dealers in the pipeline. There's yeah. a hotel in the pipeline. There's a lot of new things coming. So that, that is an important component of our revenue. And that's revenue that people can't take away from us. We get that every year. So new growth is our friend, especially on the commercial side. And then also, when we see that increase on the commercial side, it takes pressure off the residential side mm -hmm. from the overall levy and what we have to, uh, how we apportion those taxes out to all taxpayers. Um, so that's the other benefit of having growth on the commercial side. Councilor Carney. Um, just a 
I, I think I'm correct in saying this is the first time in a while that a mayor has uh, um, suggested to department heads to not not submit a level funded budget but a level service budget and that's um, I, I would imagine it's a relief to most of those department heads to be able to at least know that they can offer or provide to you a budget that shows the same amount of services rather than what would be necessarily cuts mm -hmm. and um, while there's always room for improvement and room to, to grow, um, the, the fact of being able to at least know that they may not have, be facing serious cuts in each department, mm -hmm. again, is just a, a great relief to yeah. all of us here in short. Definitely, and obviously thank you to the, to the voters and the residents, because they obviously played a major role in that in terms of the override, so yeah. Other comments or questions? Otherwise, I would, um, Entertain a motion to adjourn this joint meeting of the city. Second, second. Okay, so there's been a motion made um, and seconded. Um, all those in favor of adjourning this joint meeting say aye. 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 Opposed? The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.